thanks for coming to my talk about Gradle 4.0. I will provide a quick update uh, what the Gradle team is working on lately, what you can expect from the next major release. Um, yeah, and maybe talk about some other stuff in between. Um, yeah, my name is René, just quick about myself. I'm living in Berlin, working for the Gradle, um, Gradle company, working on the Gradle code base now for like six years and five years. I got paid for that now. Uh, yeah, if you have questions about slides or examples or whatever, don't bother, reach out to me by email or Twitter or whatever works for you best. Um, so what will I talk about in this talk? I won't give a lot of an introduction to Gradle, so who's using Gradle already? Perfect, uh, that's good. So I talk about some of the latest features or my favorite latest features we added and that will be part of Gradle 4.0. Um, some of the next features we plan to have, um, have some demos prepared, we will have hopefully enough time for questions and hopefully good answers. And I brought some stickers if all of the other stuff is not working for you. Uh, yeah, so for those of, for the some of you who haven't used Gradle yet, that's the Gradle management summary I usually provide. So Gradle is a multi-purpose software automation tool. Oh, that's, a, that's a tough term, I guess. Um, you can more or less build, automate, and deliver better software faster. So that's our goal here. Um, we have cross-platform support. So Gradle comes from the JVM, so that's likely why I'm here. Uh, Java is the first language we supported together with Groovy, but now there are other languages on the JVM, like Kotlin or Scala or whatnot. We support, but we have also support for native languages like C++, um, C, and we got even assembler support. Um, quite painful to write the test courage for that. I did that part. Um, yeah, it's Apache license, so you can use it for free uh, and don't bother about any open source issues there. And lately we added on top of the build tool some cloud service you can use to, to make the usage of Gradle more efficient and benefit from some more ideas we had there. I'll briefly talk about that later. Um, one slide about the momentum, so I think that's one of the big apart from the tool itself, that's one of the big advantages we have now on the market is like, at the moment there are about 30 people working full-time on the Gradle code base, so if you look at other build tools, they usually don't have that momentum, and if they added colored output, colored lock console output, they made a release out of it, so that's not what we usually do. And you can see that we have a quite frequent release cycle, so usually we release every yeah, four weeks is really optimistic, let's say six weeks, uh, six to seven weeks. Um, our latest release, major release was 3. Dot. We plan to have the 4.0 release, candidate one release by Monday. Actually, we tr I hoped it would be out yesterday, but yeah, something is blocking that. So you can play around with 4.0 pretty soonish. Um, but the one thing about our release strategy is that 4.0 will not have more major features than, let's say, 3.5, just because it's a major release. Uh, what we usually do is we, we, we do a couple of releases, and then if we think, okay, um, now we have five 3. whatever releases, um, we usually say, okay, is that good enough to, to argue for a new major release? Then let's do it. And then we have, a, because some companies they just switch to ma major releases, and it's also a statement about the... Yeah, it's a marketing thing, it's a statement about your um, productivity and so on. So 4.0, yeah, you will not have m m more new features than, let's say, 3.5 had. Um, one of uh, our CTO once said when he was asked, what will 2.0 be like? He said, actually, it will just piss users off because we cut out all the deprecations. And something similar also happens to 4.0, I guess, because we, it's also important for us so that we cut the uh, deprecated stuff out, keep the code base clean, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about one of the latest features we added to Gradle. So who knows what that is? That's an eye in it. Yeah, exactly. Kotlin, good, good guess. So Kotlin is, I guess, <laughs> I guess you, you heard about it. It's an island in uh, near St. Petersburg and uh, surprise, surprise, also language uh, provided by the JetBrains guys. So uh, Gradle started to add Kotlin support as a, as a Gradle DSL, as an alternative to, to the Groovy-based DSL last year. And uh, with 4.0, we are getting really close to a full or be feature complete there and say that uh, the Kotlin support will be 1.0. It, it will be actually 0.9 whatever, so if you start from scratch, you can get quite far with Kotlin already, with Kotlin DSL. Um, but there's some bumpers there we want to have finished before we would call that 1.0. Um, a little bit about the motivation about that. So Kotlin got really popular. Uh, but that's not how usually, th that was not the main motivation here. Um, one of the motivations was that the current DSL in Gradle written in, in, in Groovy uh, is, is basically, is, or the basics are there since 0.2 or something. And it was never designed for performance or for tooli tooling friendliness. So, and there, there, there are the things I, I heard the most that even for experienced developers, it's really hard to to uh, to get code completion, and usually Java developers, I guess, most of you. So you're kind of blessed with your IDEs, IntelliJ users, I guess, mostly. Um, and we want to have wanted to have really outstanding tooling support for Gradle, and that was missing for quite a while. For Eclipse, we started doing that. Uh, by establishing BuildShip as a plugin written by ourselves. Um, but just crafting build scripts doesn't, doesn't felt well. The Groovy f support was quite bad for different reasons and never got better, actually. Um, and now with Kotlin, we expect a lot of this. And the other thing is that since you're working in the IDE and you write your tests and you write your um, production code, obviously, in the IDE, all the usual habits you have about refactoring, looking up documentation, and just how you write code, um, this pattern we wanted to bring back to, to how you um, write your build scripts. And that wasn't really possible with, with the existing DSL because um, yeah, the, the IDE support was lagging and so on and so on. Um, so that motivated us to start looking into Kotlin uh, Kotlin itself, again, quick management summary. There are, there are guys who, who know way more details about Kotlin. Uh, it's a statically typed language that the major difference to, to Groovy. Uh, the 1.0 release happened last year. Uh, what I personally like a lot about it, and it's similar to what Groovy drove, was that it's written, driven by pragmatism, right? It was designed by the JetBrains guys, or is designed by, mostly by the JetBrains guys, and they just wanted to have a pragmatic language. Uh, and I'm not here to, to bitch about Scala, but Scala always felt more like, yeah, do you have a PhD? Yeah, you're fine, use it. Um, and it has a considerable uptake, particularly in the Android community, because it supported new language features, uh, it supports new language features, which, which you now might have with Lambdas in Java 8 and so on, but it compiles back to, to bytecode 1.6, so it could be used for Android. And, and now, and since last week, um, or last week, Android or Google, the Google team announced that uh, Kotlin is now a first-class uh, language for the Android platform. So they have, so we consider even more uptake in in that world. And it provides enticing opportunities. Um, code completion, refactoring, documentation, lookup, all the stuff you know from your DSL and your favorite language. And it has quite good support for crafting DSLs. There was just a talk by uh, Nicolas about crafting DSL in Kotlin. Maybe you have seen that. It's really nice. Uh, keeps your build scripts clean and declarative. And that's what build scripts should be like. Um, not all of them are. That's a different topic. Um, 
yeah, we worked closely with the JetBrains guys. There were in the in the early days. Now there are some back and forth because you always have to bring three parties together: the Kotlin team, the IntelliJ team, and the Gradle team. So, um, but it got way better now with Kotlin 1.1 support. So uh, you can play around that, and I think it's really worth considering, especially if you try to try Gradle f f on a new project. I would I would start with writing scripts in Kotlin. Um, that's how it looks like. It looked quite similar to what you what you know already from from the Groovy DSL. Um, yeah, nothing too new there. We just wanted to have a language or a DSL that also kind of uh, if you're decent Kotlin developers, there shouldn't be any surprises, but on the other hand, it should be also readable like the Groovy DSL was in between. And with Groovy at the be we, we made some mistakes with the first DSL, like adding too much um, yeah, so-called magic to it. We had some AST transformation, which make it hard to, to guess, and we could never remove that. But it's not... So one thing I, I wanted to mention before I switch to the next one, it's not all about Groovy. We could have written a similar DSL maybe in Groovy, which was also better in terms of more explicit and better supported. But at that point, we choose to go with Kotlin um, just because uh, the, the Kotlin team is there. And it's, it's considerable uptake, and we notice that some bigger companies are kind of reluctant to use Groovy or, yeah. Um, so one quick question about the builds you have. Whose build is too fast? None? Yeah, I had one at, at Stockholm who said, yeah, mine. Um, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's a painful thing when you work on a build tool. Everybody's complaining about performance. So a build is never fast enough, so you, you can never make all the develop all users happy. And we really consider performance as a feature. Um, we, we formed a dedicated performance team last year, beginning of last year or something, who, who, and that team is really looking into performance issues, pairing with different teams within the Gradle organization, or also with the, we, we worked a lot with the Google team um, to make the Android builds faster. And performance also, it's, it's really a feature because it, it changed the way you work with your build. If you, if you invoke a build and you need to wait couple of minutes, hours, whatever, till things got finished, uh, your workflow is well completely different if you would get fast feedback immediately, right? So you invoke the build, then you go to, I don't know what the favorite, in, in Germany it's uh, Spiegel Online, which people are surfing, so like news, and that's what you do in between your builds, uh, or you see big organizations uh, juggling whatever. Um, so if you have fast feedback, it's way better back and forth, and you, you work better with the with the build itself. Um, yeah, as I said, we formed a dedicated performance team. Um, the f initial goal was to provide better Android developer experience. Who of you is Android developer, by the way? Yeah, some. Okay, cool. Um, so the first things we worked on was the Android developer experience together with the Android tooling team. Uh, get faster dependency resolution. Uh, that's also often kind of a bottleneck. Um, and lower the configuration time. So if you use Gradle, I don't know how big your builds are. But as the bigger your build gets, the, the more painful usually the configuration time gets. Because that's what you pay every time you invoke Gradle. And that's something... Uh, yeah, th there was a talk by, by our CTO, Hans. And he once, at that last conference we had, he announced our goal is zero configuration time, and none of the engineers knew about that slide. And we just looked at it, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. We're getting close there, but it's not zero yet. Um, so maybe some numbers. I, I got that from, uh, from our blog post we wrote, or we announced last week to the Google I.O. So that's the outcome about using the latest Gradle uh, together with the latest Android plugin. So we can see that. Uh, we make major improvements compared to l earlier Android versions. And that was really biting us, because in Android you have that um, variant builds that you can build all kinds of versions of your application, and that kind of makes your task graph or your build more complex than ever. 
Um, yeah, and you can see in all different scenarios um, the way the build got way better. And th 3.0 is not released yet. I think they release a preview or something. I don't know how it's called in Android, but it will be out pretty soon. Um, so enough about comp performance. I will get back to that later and in different slides. Uh, one really neat feature, um, we added, I don't know, Gradle 3.0. Three maybe, I don't know in detail, is composite builds. So if you work in different teams and have different, uh, let's say, complete diff different projects and different builds and different life cycles, uh, you often have the problem that how do you integrate with that one? Um, do you wait for the binary to be out there or what? What do you do if you want to debug something or work really uh, have both sources in your code base? So you have an upstream dependency or you have an upstream dependency on a team in your organization and you want to t try something out. Um, that's where you can now use composited builds to include those projects into your build by source. Um, what people started to do or, or teams started to do is creating a big mono repo or using that approach like, like Google does and build everything from source. Uh, of course, you pay the price. You have to build everything again and again, have one uh, repository. It's quite expensive to have. Um, yeah, and does it really make the dev life easier? Yeah, I kind of doubt that. And the other thing, uh, what also one use case I often got bitten by is if you have a Gradle plugin or you write a third party, has who of you has written a Gradle plugin? Okay, cool. Um, and you want to test that against your local copy or so, how it's, it was kind of painful to do and to debug. Um, and now you can do that with composite builds. Um, the way it looks like, so what you can do now, we added two things. One is the a uh, command line statement, so you can run Gradle on your build, and then you say, okay, include a different build. Let's say I checked out my utils. Is it? Uh, it doesn't work so well. Um, maybe my mouse works better, yeah. So you have that statement, and now you can reference um, a project on your, on your disk, and now what happens when you build that project is that the dim dependency you have in your build pointing to, I don't know, let's say org ecme my run, or sorry, my utils 1.0 is replaced by a source dependency as, 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 as if you would have a multi-project build. Um, but yeah, but, but it's completely a different code base. Um, alternatively to that, if you, if you want to work on a composited, uh, composite, uh, more regularly, you can do create a persistent definition of how your composite build looks like by having a settings Gradle file where you enter or add all the included builds you want to have. So maybe you usually work on my app on your own or usually just from source, as you know. But then alternatively, you have that uh, composite build where you declare all the dependencies by an included build and now you get everything from source. Um, yeah, that are the two approaches. So let me show you how that works. Uh, so what I have here, is that the right one? Yeah, so I have a composite build. Uh, uh, yeah, it looks okay. Um, Pretty just a demo library. Uh, you can't see. Let me check. Maybe let's do it like this. Um, so here, my Java library, it just demo code. Um, I have some library method here, and usually what you have, and I have a dependency on comments lang. And Usually everything works fine. I, I, I'm completely isolated. I have binary dependency. My build is fast. I, I'm shielded from all the other things because I wait on the releases. But now I want to test something. 
let's say on a library I'm using, and in this case a commons lang. So what you can see here, I can I can dig into that. So uh, IntelliJ is clever enough to to give me the sources, but I I can't change anything here, right? Because yeah, it's binary. And if we look at that reference, you can see it's in the Gradle cache. It's downloaded from the Maven repository. So now I want to test something out, maybe change a little bit here and test if that fixes my issue. Um, what I can do is um, I can now do Gradle, let's see, in clean idea, idea to regenerate the idea files and point to that comments lang build. Um, ah, damn it. <laughs> and what you get now is actually you get the other project into. Um, you can do that from IntelliJ yourself. I'm using an EAP version, so that's why I generated from from the command line. But now you have those projects. It looks like a multi-project build kind of. And now if I navigate to to random utils, I can I can test something out like like here because random utils is now not referenced by by binary from the Grail cache, but it's referenced by um, this the file in your code base. Um, yeah, that's neat. And the other use case, um, so maybe as a side note, who of you have used, or let's go to the build again. Um, so for those of you who use custom plugins, so there's a, there's one really popular third-party plugin I, I recommend everybody to use who uses Gradle. It's called Nebula Lint. Nebula is the is a shortcut for Netflix build language. It's a it's a Netflix team maintaining their build builds, and they wrote a couple of open source projects or a couple of open source Gradle plugins, and most of them are really good, um, and they add really top-notch features on top of what you get from Gradle by free. And one really nice one is is that Lint plugin. Uh, what that Lint plugin actually does is um, it it lints your build script, and so you can um, it it gives you some warnings if something is outdated, like here, you know, that there's a duplicate dependency class or there's an unused dependency in your build script and it, it really helps to keep your build script maintained. Um, there I had one motivation to, to add an additional rule to that build and that was that with all the Maven fanboys out there, they was always stating that, hey, yeah, with with Gradle, uh, you can just script it down and it's it's not declarative and I don't want to have that. So usually what they do is uh, they put this F statement in a in a plugin and now it's declarative because it's hidden by a plugin. So I wanted to have something similar. So what I did is I created a no if rule. So I said, okay, we can have that in Gradle too. I want a build script that's only declarative and that this allows you to, to do... Uh, if statements in your build, you would need to uh, plug in to do that. And now, what I uh, let's say clean idea idea and build um, And the way it works with the Lint plugin is like you um, you write a rule which implements just a certain um, abstract method and then you can have that statement here. And now you, so I have that local copy here and I want to test that. So now all I need to do is Lint. Um, 
And now I can know the build fails because there's one critical violation, so the build will never be successful. And that's now something I can point to the Maven fanboys and can say, hey, uh, you can you can f enforce Gradle to be really declarative. Um, yeah, so Gradle in plugin, that's something you need to check out. Um, next topic I want to talk about is compile avoidance. So I don't know how big your projects are, but if you have a multi-project build and you change something on the very root, usually what happens is you have to compile all the stuff down because the class path has changed, right? And especially if you have big builds, that's 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 a burden you pay. And if you if you listen to my or saw my slide before, if you moved everything to a mono repo, it's even worse because only source dependencies and your class path is changing if you s change something on the root, so that's kind of painful. We have this up-to-date check in Gradle, it's been there forever, that relies on the task and inputs and outputs. So if you haven't changed anything, usually your build is really fast because everything is marked as up-to-date, right? Um, and that works fine, but but what happens if if your normal use case is not that you run the build if nothing has changes, something has changes. And so we try to be better in that use case. And so we added way better compile avoidance. So Gradle now detects when, when we you have a binary interface change. So that means if your public class or, or the public parts of your class changes, uh, that knowledge leaks down to the downstream dependencies and you recompile. If only the internal things change, like private methods or whatever, uh, you don't need to recompile a lot. And that dramatically improves the build performance. Um, I show that later in a demo. Uh, actually, now. Um, so I, I just have a really simple project here. Uh, with three different sub projects nothing nothing too crazy so i have an app that depends on core and utils uh, it does nothing fancy so if i run if i go to the so projects so you can see so i have app core utils so i go to app now I run a clean build. Uh, uh, um. So and what you see, first first time you build it, so with Dash G I use a new Gradle user home to, to demo that also downloading stuff and so on. So you see all kinds of things need to be done, but the important part is Compile Java actually. Um, before you can compile app, you need to compile its dependencies, right? Core and utils. And if you do that again, it's up to date. Uh, now let's change something in utils. So I have, I created a a method here, like get full name, and I want to get rid of it because I don't need that. Um, now if I compile, let's do without clean. What's happened is pretty simple. Core has changed, so nothing new to expect. If the class pass goes back to, um, or is leaking into utils. Utils need to be recompiled. Change class path leaking to my app and needs to be recompiled too. But now let's say I I just looking into into some of the implementation details of my um, of my upstream dependencies. So here in person I made a typo. So I just changed the way um, I, I changed a private thing in my in my project. So just uh, private field and let's say, uh, I don't know, I, I can do something more like changing a implementation of, of a method. 
And now what you usually, what you would expect is that core builds, well, yeah, core builds again. And now you have, you have changed bytecode. So just with that up-to-date checking where we take hash sums into account, that, that would still leak down to, the, to a change class path because the, yeah, the, the implementation has changed, so the bytecode has changed. So let's see what happens actually. <laughs> of course. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I should have obviously used... Um, uh, nah. Nah. <laughs> Works perfect. So I changed the implementation detail. And now what you see is that even though the, 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 the jar file or the dependency itself has changed in core, it does not leak into compiling utils and app again. And that, especially if you have major or bigger builds, that makes a huge difference in, in productivity because you don't pay the, the, uh, the price of compiling everything again and again. And the way it works is actually under the hood is that we generate a bytecode stub we just have the public API and we compile about that against that and not against the full um, jar with the full content in there. Uh, yeah. Um, there's some more Java goodness we added, like uh, make, making the Java incremental compiler the default. Um, we introduced a Java library plugin um, to get actually the POMs right and, and also pay get better, cla less class path leakage. Because what you have in Maven, of what came with the Maven, uh, with the Maven model of having compile and runtime, and which we adopted in Gradle, so it, mm, not blaming Maven here, is that you declare dependencies for compile, actually. And by default, these dependencies leak into your API, because they are API by default. But but now, since you now imagine you have a library and you use Guava, and now your your downstream dependency or li or user uh, applies your code, and what they usually do, they they do. Oh, can I do? So what can I do? And then they see. Okay, I have. Oh, I have Guava and on my class path, so I use it. And now it's really hard for you to uh, switch to a newer Guava version, or maybe even replace it with something else because you're leaking. Your, your class path there. And if something is visible in, in IntelliJ or IDE, people use it. That's just the case. And so with the Java library plugin, we try to fix that and, and really distinguish between the API and the implementation. Um, yeah. Um, talking about up-to-date checks, I mentioned that already, and I guess since you are Gradle users, most of you, you know how that works. So usually, in, in a nutshell, Everything you used or that has been generated the last time when you run exactly the same build on this particular machine uh, is can be uh, is considered to be marking the build as up to date. So taking compile for example, so you compile something or you compile something in an earlier build, the classes are still there, your sources haven't touched, things are marked as up to date. If you um, if you change the source level or something else, the build runs again. But you never you never share uh, that information against another with your CI, let's say, or with your uh, coworkers. And that's something you might want to fix. So we think that Grail can do better what when it comes to these up to date checking and. Um, why shouldn't we not uh, take into account builds from any time before when they run any build that matches the, the, the project uh, from anywhere, actually? So we introduced with, I think, Gradle 3.5, we started introducing build cache and it, we added more and more features. Um, and that's something that, that is a persistent cache that uh, takes also changes into account that 
does also take changes into account from different builds you have and you have invoked uh, in your earlier days. And that makes a huge difference. So if you just use a local build, like in this example, that also makes it already makes a difference if you work on different, um, let's say, branches or you have different copies of your same project. You can reuse the exact matching artifacts from there. But it gets way more interesting if you, if you take that on the next level and make a distributed cache. So what we do now, what we provide now is that you can have one, that you can declare your build cache and can say, okay, you're checking against a remote machine and say, if, if that machine has already built your stuff, then reuse this. Typical example, CI server. Uh, you have your nightlies run and maybe that takes hours and hours. I don't know how complex your builds are. And we had a client actually who, they, they came in every morning, they checked out their stuff that takes, I don't know, they use a complete fucked up version control system, so it took half an hour for that. And then it took another hour to, to regenerate the workspace. So, and they're standing at the coffee desk the whole time. So, but actually the CI machine did all the stuff already. It built the exact same jars already they, they need to use on their local machine. And why can't we reuse that? And now what you can do is like you can declare your build cache. You can say, okay, I have a remote build cache pointing to, let's say, your CI server who pro or, or to a cache that is feeded with your CI server. And then you can say, okay, am I allowed to push to that server or not? So in this case, only the CI server pushes into that cache and all the developers, let's say, they consume it. Um, yeah, and that is a huge benefit. So actually, when I'm talking about making builds faster, the, the, the best way to make things faster actually is to, um, is to do less, right? The less you do, the faster you get. Uh, it sounds like cheating, but that's how it works. Um, yeah, and usually when, when developers start talking about your builds, it's not the nice, they're not there and say, hey, that's great, that works fine. Usually they complain or they have an issue with their builds. And we wanted, to, so I did consulting for quite a while now. And um, so I have to talk about builds a lot. So, and what we invented now is uh, something to, to make that easier. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could collaborate on a build better? So you, you have a failing build locally and how do you discuss that with your colleague? Do you just uh, pass the, the, the stack trace or actually you call him, bring him in and you sit together on your screen? Or how do you optimize build performance? That's a huge thing, especially in huge organizations you want to do. Or even comparing different builds. Let's say you have a developer on on one side, maybe here in Kiev, and his build is really fast, but you have another developer, I don't know, somewhere East Asia or whatever, and his build is already slow, so how can you compare where that gets, comes from? Um, yeah, and what we started to introduce or now have is Gradle build scans. Uh, that's an online service. You can also have an on-premise version installed in your organization. Uh, a lot of Open source tools, use it, try it yourself. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I have to skip the demo on this. Um, there's a lot of lot of other stuff we worked on I haven't talked about. Uh, improved plugin API. Uh, we have a new console output. Um, now, Gradle is, we are trying hard to get the parallel by default on. So everything in Gradle is parallel, like downloading artifacts, running tasks, etc. And there's more and more to come. Uh, so the next things, the, the very next things we are focusing on is we keep that performance team because, again, a build is never fast enough. And there's there are some more low, not so low-hanging fruits anymore, but there are more things we think we can do. We want to get that Gradle Kotlin support on par with what's there with Groovy. And we also want to have better integration with first class plugins like you saw with that Nebula plugins. And one thing we, we really would like to have is kind of remote builds. So if you need to build something that requires a, especially, a, a special environment like Windows or so, you build a native API, you should be able to invoke it from your Mac or 
Unix laptop and just run the particular parts on that Windows box. That's something we, we're looking into. I guess I have some minutes for questions. Ah, cool. Thank you for your, for your talk. I have two questions. So first question is, uh, when are you planning to support uh, GDK 9 so we can run Grindle on <laughs> GDK 9? And second question, uh, are you planning some uh, support or integration with Jigsaw system? Thank you. Um, so when to expect Java 9 support? Actually, there, there, it is possible to get it working in a, in, a, in a tweaked environment. You just can't invoke Gradle itself. Uh, with Java 9, but you can point the compile task to Java 9. That should already work, I think. Uh, we plan to have Jigsaw support, also with kind of um, with the functionality we already have, like stubbing the bytecode and stuff. You, we, we have the foundations for that, and we spiked that. <sighs> it's a long discussion with Jigsaw, and we actually want to have support that does not even require Jigsaw, with like have a migration path there, so then if Hopefully, Jigsaw got switched on. We we are there and support that out of the box. But you could, we could make that happen without with Java 8 actually from the to to already enforce these these requirements. And we plan to do that starting soonish. Yeah, good good point. I missed that on my slide here. Yeah. There is another one, and he was first, but. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the first question is about include build. Can we include builds from the GitHub, or actually from any Git repository directly, or only local ones? Mm, you have to clone it before. So it's not like in Go you can do something like this, right? Yeah, but uh, I think it will be a good feature. Uh, maybe. Just like but you can. Okay, now you have to you have to clone it. You have to take that manual step up front. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the second one is about build cache. Uh, do you have any plugins for build systems right now? For example, you have a what? Sorry. Plugins for build systems. Mm, you mean supporting other build systems than Gradle for the cache? Um, actually, supporting. How, how can we push this uh, cache, cache to any build system, uh, build server, sorry? Um, okay, there, there are two things. One is a, there's a public API to that. Um, we can implement your own backend, let's say. And there's a, what we call Grail Enterprise, which we sell as a backend, actually. But, but there is a, there's a public, since Gradle is open source, there's a public backend you can implement, and there's a, there's a sample implementation using Hazelcast you can go use as a starting point to play around. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have also two questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, first one, if this uh, feature with project linkage works as well for Eclipse, or it's um, for the I well, if you generate it from the command line, it yeah. does. Um, no, it works. It works also on Eclipse because if you use a build chip plugin, that's yeah. the requirement. Yeah. Because uh -huh. actually, it's driven by the build chip plugin. The build chip plugin okay. was able to do that before Gradle Core could do okay, that. Actually, okay, good. Yeah. And uh, the second question is: uh, Let's say I have not uh, Java, just Java application. I have Java web application which has uh, web assets and so on. I, and I have two such applications. And I would like to merge them. Is it possible somehow? Because now I have custom solution. If it's possible now with Gradle, well, great. at the moment, what you do with a, what we do with a composite build is really just on a project level we integrate that. Uh -huh. uh, really merging, you would merge two tasks, right? I, I, you would, I would merge like two to assets. Uh, only uh, web content folders. Uh, because for Java classes, it's obviously not not out of the box. Okay. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I think we're done. If anybody has still some questions, we can continue in your uh, flip chart. Yeah, and I okay. still have the stickers, right? So cool. if you want one, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I put the slides on GitHub. <laughs>